Muhammad Ali has gone down in history as being one of the greatest boxers of all time. His achievements in boxing would pave the way for future champions and inspire millions. His unique personality was only matched by his incredible skill in the ring. Many heavyweight champions regard him as the greatest boxer of all time, saying that he wasn't someone who had to work on his skill, but rather he was born with an incredible gift. He fought in the Olympics and would go on to become a world champion boxer. Ali stood at over six foot and had a unique fighting style, relying heavily on his quick footwork and being able to avoid punches at close range. Couple this with his incredible speed and accuracy, and in his prime he was untouchable. Muhammad Ali also spoke up on many political issues during his time. This included his name being changed from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali, and refusing to enter the military. Just before Ali's fight with George Foreman in 1974, he said the iconic quote, Floats like a butterfly, stings like a bee, his hands can't hit what his eyes can't see. However, there was a side to Muhammad Ali that many people weren't aware of. He even tried to openly talk about it on The Tonight Show back in 1973, but the host and even the audience just laughed at him. This was the subject of UFOs. Muhammad Ali had started talking about the subject during the interview, something that the crowd thought was a joke. However, during this interesting interview, he goes on to talk about the topic for three minutes. It's important to note that during the 1970s, if somebody openly talked about UFOs, they were branded as crazy. The topic was definitely in its darker days, with people who came forward with their encounters being immediately debunked, or called a liar. Ali had talked about his encounters with these mysterious crowds, even going on to say that during his lifetime he had encountered around 16 UFOs. During the Tonight Show, he was meant to be promoting his rematch with heavyweight champion Ken Norton, but as mentioned, the conversation took a different turn. Before he talks about the topic, the host notices that something is playing on the boxer's mind, and that he seems to be a little troubled. This is when Ali opens up and says the following. I've been studying UFOs. Did you know there's UFOs unidentified flying objects flying around above us? I'm serious they've sighted a bunch above Georgia. I've seen them at night. They have real photos of them. The government knows about them but the people don't seem to talk about them. I have moving photographs of these sources that people took and I'm surprised that people don't talk about them. The talk show host then goes on to mock Muhammad Ali while he's trying to talk about this topic, or while the audience is laughing at him. You can tell that he was someone who'd looked into this topic, and researched the various sightings that had been happening around that time. The host then goes on to say that what people were photographing and seeing were most likely satellites. Muhammad Ali then responds by saying the following, no, these crafts were 50 feet above the highway. They call it swamp gas. They don't know what they are. I think I know what they are. They are sources and objects coming into our atmosphere flying around, and people got pictures of them. They are sighted in many cities. They're red, green and blue lights, but authorities brush it off like we're mental. Funny enough, after he says this, the host then asks why they don't land and come and say hi, to which Ali responds that they can't get no sense out of the people here. The audience then cheers, but Ali sits there with a serious expression on his face. He then details that he has photographs and moving films of these mysterious unidentified flying objects. Those who have watched the interview have said it's bizarre how the interviewer tries to debunk everything that Muhammad Ali says. At another point in the interview, Ali says he was able to catch one of these crafts moving around in the sky, to which the host replies that it could be a motion picture. Ali's expression after this seems to be a mixture of frustration and sadness. After reading the room, he eventually gives up and goes on to talk about the fight. Interestingly, after this footage was originally aired, it was cut out of the replays. Then the producers decided to cut the whole interview together. As Summer pointed out, why would they do this? 
was Ali touching on a subject that at that time was considered off limits. During the 1970s, UFOs were rarely talked about, and if you were someone that wanted to bring up the topic, you'd usually be debunked straight away and the topic would be changed. Similar to what happened to Muhammad Ali during this interview. It's interesting to see how far we've come in regards to this topic. Now media outlets are openly talking about UFOs, with various high-up officials even admitting that some UFO footage that's been captured is genuine. The government hasn't always been open about UFOs. However, it seems that in recent years officials have decided to change that. UFOs have been talked about more than ever, with some theorists putting forward the idea that disclosure could be coming anytime soon. After all, going back several weeks ago, the Pentagon formally released three unclassified videos taken by Navy pilots. The mysterious videos showing UFOs have been circulating for years. It's caused various theories to be put forward to try and explain them. However, for skeptics, they wouldn't believe the footage until the government came forward and announced they were real. And this is exactly what happened. And they were given the name of unidentified aerial phenomena. Although this is massive news, it's not anything new. Pilots have been coming forward for years and detailing their interactions with unidentified flying objects. One person said the following. The comments are interesting. And even after they capture these unidentified aerial objects on camera, it still feels like they're downplaying it. Although this is great news and I'm happy they're admitting the videos are genuine and show something mysterious. What about all the people that's been told to be quiet when they've talked about these encounters? And I'm not just talking about everyday people. People in high positions who have talked about these objects have been branded as crazy. Where's the justice in that? All they were trying to do was reveal what they saw and they were told to be quiet. With some people even losing their jobs or being demoted over it. Many UFO believers have said they're excited by the recent UFO videos and news that we've recovered off-world crafts. This could be one of the greatest discoveries that the human race has ever made. Not only this, but believers have said it's big news coming from the government and officials. As for the last few decades, they've hardly been open to the idea of talking about unidentified flying objects, and have even gone out of their way to debunk those who have come forward with their stories. Perhaps then we should be celebrating this news, and looking forward to whatever information the government is holding. Some pointed out this is just the tip of the iceberg, and that officials know a lot more than what they've told us. Interestingly, celebrities like Tom DeLonge have been vocal about UFOs. Going back a month ago, Tom DeLonge said the following on his Twitter account. Everyone will know the reality soon, and unfortunately it's not just something to laugh at. It's pretty unnerving with some bad news and some good news. And with that in mind, all we can do is deal with it honestly and openly. We now know what Tom was referring to. It turns out that in a recent statement by Steve Justice, who is the Chief Operating Officer of To The Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, says how the organization got their hands on exotic properties. He said the following about the object. The structure and composition of these materials are not from any known existing military or commercial application. They've been collected from sources with varying levels of chain of custody documentation. So we are focusing on verifiable facts and working to develop independent scientific proof of the materials properties and attributes. In some cases, the manufacturing technology required to fabricate the materials is only now becoming available. It's interesting to think what Muhammad Ali would think about the recent news in regards to UFOs. Now more than ever, more people are coming forward with their sightings and encounters, and it seems that as a whole, more people are open to the idea of there being life out there. With the Milky Way galaxy being home to billions of planets, and the universe being home to billions of galaxies, it's easy to see why more people are believing that there's life out there. For some may believe that if life does exist somewhere in the universe, it's on a distant planet billions of miles away from us. But for some they believe that an advanced race may have made their way to us, 
and this is backed up by the constant reports of unidentified flying objects. The brand of Disney has always been synonymous with childhood classics, and carefree amusement parks since the animation company was founded roughly a century ago. It's because of this brand image that it comes as an unbelievable surprise that the company was believed to be at the centre of a long-standing theory, and eventual government disclosure of extraterrestrials to future populations. Although skeptics claim that this theory is nothing more than a paranoid rant targeted at one of the largest United States corporations to ever exist, it appears that with the discovery of the lost Disney documentary surrounding unidentified flying objects in the alien cover-up, there is definitely a profound amount of legitimacy to the claim. So today we're going to take a look at the Walt Disney UFO documentary, and what it means for the government disclosure of the extraterrestrial visitation of our planet. Titled Alien Encounters and hosted by Robert Urig, the Disney documentary clearly states its purpose in the opening scenes. The beginning scene starts with an opening speech by Michael Eisner, the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company from 1984 to 2005. He goes on to state the following. With more and more scientific evidence of alien encounters and UFO sightings, the idea of creatures from another planet might not be as far-fetched as we once thought. In fact, one of you out there could have the next alien encounter. He ends his speech with claiming that the documentary is a televised special that was most likely meant to be shown in three parts. The first section of the documentary opens with the host Robert Urich stating the following. We must prepare you for the future with some shocking insights of the recent past. The next four minutes of the documentary then show stunning high-quality video clips of extraterrestrial sightings and visitations, with one such video recorded back in 1991 in Ottawa, Canada, where it appears that an unmarked vehicle meets with a landed UFO craft in a remote location, as an anonymous videographer documents the scene. The footage is then cut short to show an interview with Captain Kevin Randall, a retired Air Force intelligence officer that claims there is more than a substantial amount of evidence for the proof of the existence of extraterrestrial visitations, and that they are a massive security threat that cannot be stopped with our current technology. It's at this moment in the documentary that we see the real reason behind its creation. Shortly after Captain Kevin Randall talks about the national security threat of alien life, the documentary goes into detail about a federal-funded study done by the Brookings Institution that warns the government to prepare for the discovery of life in space, and that the disclosure of alien visitation would lead to mass panic and the total destruction of civilization as we know it. Could it be that Walt Disney was hired by the United States government to begin slow disclosure of alien visitation to the general population? via movies and cartoons to help prepare us for our meeting with superior interstellar creatures. In fact, the documentary host states shortly after this interview in an exact quote, Disney Imagineers have designed a way to prepare humans for their inevitable alien encounter. At this point in the documentary, the host of the televised event explains the theory surrounding why extraterrestrials are visiting our planet. In a blunt, matter-of-fact way of speaking, Without hesitation or doubt in the claims, the host says the following. What the world didn't know in 1945 was that the atomic bomb's brilliant burst of energy would also be mankind's cosmic calling card, announcing to the universe that a technological society had evolved on a small blue planet in the backwaters of the stars. Alien enthusiasts have often noticed that UFO sightings and alien abductions began in mass following the first use of nuclear weaponry on the planet, could Disney have been provided this information by the US government as the actual reason for alien visitation, explained to them via alien contact? Oddly enough, the host states this is less of a theory and more of a verified fact. At around 20 minutes into the documentary, a chilling discovery is made as uncovered government documents go into the true dangers of UFOs arriving at our planet. During the heightened tensions of the Cold War, Sensors for intercontinental ballistic missiles began to detect mysterious high-speed movements through the atmosphere that resembled intelligent flown crafts, with turns, twists and flight patterns. 
These mysterious objects, however, would occasionally follow the paths of intercontinental ballistic missiles, with multiple cases almost leading to the total destruction of the Earth, as paranoid countries almost began nuclear missile retaliation. One such well-known event is that of the 1983 Soviet nuclear false alarm incident, that claimed to have detected the reported launch of multiple ICBMs from the United States at speeds impossible to match with any known aircraft at the time. The event would have escalated to an irrevocable full-scale nuclear war, had the Soviet Air Defense Forces officer Stanislav Petrov not refused to retaliate. Even when all the signs pointed to potential nuclear destruction, the Soviet general was selfless enough not to press the big red button that would lead to the destruction of the planet. Several hours later, it was confirmed with the US government that the reported detection of the ICBMs were false, with the official reports claiming that the sensory equipment had been giving false signals. Could the true explanation be that of extraterrestrial intervention, making the attempt to trick human beings into destroying each other in a heightened state of paranoia? It becomes apparent that the Disney documentary sees alien life as a planetary threat to all human life and not that of the friendly, enlightened creatures ready to bring us gifts that the UFO community so adamantly believe. Recovered training documents from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA for short, also holds this sentiment as the documentary clearly shows. In 1995, members of the FEMA were provided the training manual titled the following. Officer's Guide to Disaster Control which details sections titled The UFO Threat, A Fact, and other sections of the documents that teach team members how to handle UFO hazards, such as power electromagnetic fields, force field psychological effects and alien contact. The host of the documentary then continues with the government disclosure theory by following the strange documents with the quoted statement. Indications that the government's military and scientific leaders will soon release nearly half a century of official documentation of ongoing alien encounters on Earth. Was Disney aware of information of a possible disclosure way ahead of time, as part of the marketing campaign to slowly acclimate human beings to the possibility of alien life? A campaign that would later be cancelled and lead to this documentary being banned to prevent mass panic? Or has the disclosure slowly been developing into another plan over the years? It is seen as viability grow with modern day shows such as Ancient Aliens and popular cinematic science fiction blockbusters. The next 10 minutes of the Alien Encounters documentary begins to go into an in-depth study of astromicrobiology and the peculiar organisms that seem to arrive on our planet via asteroids. Although next to no evidence of the study can be found today, the documentary goes into detail about a hidden study made by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration that used research bases constructed in Antarctica as the centre for the study of bacterial life from off our planet. The study involved finding recently crashed asteroids on the icy continent, hoping that the sub-zero temperatures would help to preserve any alien bacteria and viruses for study in a secret base unable to be reached by private or competing government organisations. According to the documentary, the study found that bacteria and viruses discovered did in fact travel across interstellar space, and that they may very well be the advanced invasion force leading the way to test Earth's environment for more complex and determined creatures. The last part of the documentary immediately shifts in tone to discuss personal alien abduction events, with traumatised abductees that experience violent and privacy invading experimentation from extraterrestrial life. Featuring an interview with Bud Hopkins, the founder of the alien reduction theory, the host ends the documentary with this chilling statement. Most Americans will likely explore outer space aboard crafts of alien origin. Statistics indicate a greater probability that you will experience extraterrestrial contact within the next five years, and that within the next five years you have more of a chance to see extraterrestrials than win the state lottery but how do you prepare for such an extraordinary event? Here is the new Tomorrowland at Disney World. Scientists and Disney engineers have brought to life a possible scenario, 
that helps acclimate the public to their inevitable alien encounter. Although this three-part televised documentary was never broadcast to the American public, shortly following the creation of the documentary, the Tomorrowland section of the Magic Kingdom theme park at Walt Disney World opened the extraterrestrial alien encounter attraction that subjected children to strange binaural audio, video recordings and images of terrifying alien abduction, all of which points to evidence of the claim that Disney had been commissioned by the United States government to begin the slow acclimatization of extraterrestrial visitations to the general public, in the hopes that when the eventual and unavoidable planetary contact would be made, society would not buckle underneath the mass panic of the terrifying encounter. Back in 2012, Disney purchased the studio known as Lucasfilm, and acquired the rights to the Star Wars universe for an incredible $4 billion. Despite analysis believing that the purchase would never see a return equivalent to its cost, Disney continued with the transaction, and has gone on to make record-breaking movies featuring the Star Wars universe for children of all ages. Could the projected loss have been an acceptable cost for the purpose of space-age propaganda? Is the government disclosure project still well underway, with Disney at the head of its advertising and manipulation of the public image? With the discovery of this banned documentary, anything could very well be possible. The United States government is well known for conducting a wide variety of strange research experiments. Many of these are described as being on the cutting edge of scientific advancement. This has led to incredible breakthroughs in medicine, computer technology, agriculture and a wide variety of additional fields used across the military. Oddly enough, however, there seems to be a recently declassified government experiment that was approved for release back in 2003 surrounding the training of psychic soldiers, and enhancements to the brain known as the Gateway Process Experience Experiments. The declassified document titled Analysis and Assessment of Gateway Process seems to be a written memo between a US Army researcher at the CIA and sent to a US Army operational commander located out of Fort Meade. The study of the memo seems to have been the analysis surrounding the legitimacy of the Gateway Process study as the researcher writes the following in an opening statement. You asked me to provide an assessment of the Gateway experience in terms of its mechanics and ultimate practicality. Most likely the US government was unaware of what the Gateway process really entailed, and so sent an independent researcher to the examination areas to undergo the process, and learn if there was any legitimacy to the study in the first place for continued funding. Within the first paragraph of the document, however, the researcher makes a special note to include that the gateway process was a technique designed by Isaac Bentov, stating the following. Based on conversations with a physician who took the gateway training with me, I had recourse to the biomedical models developed by Isaac Bentov to obtain information concerning the physical aspects of the process. For those that are not aware, Isaac Bentoff was a leading Israeli researcher, known for his incredible contributions in the creation of patents for the steerable heart catheter, ECG electrodes, pacemaker leads and a number of other patents that would help to form the Boston Scientific Meditech Corporation. Isaac Bentoff was also known for his contributions to the Israeli Defense Force, being one of the lead inventors on the Israeli missile project, as well as many other improvised weapons. However, what many are not aware of surrounding the Israeli inventor was his devout belief in following the mystical side of consciousness, which would lead to his primary contributions to the Gateway Process experiment. John Abel Bentos' fellow business partner was once quoted as saying that Bentos said the following. Bentos was interested in how the brain worked and actually attached electrodes to his head, which were connected to a function generator in which he could change the wave shape and the power and learned about how the brain interprets these different frequencies. Hinting at the plausibility of Bentoff's connection with the gateway process experiment. The document then goes into the breakdown of what the gateway process holds, with the first explanation from the researcher being in regards to the human body's natural frequencies of the brain, and the frequency following response. 
According to the study, a form of enlightenment can be triggered in a person's mind when both hemispheres of the brain begin operating at the same frequency, allowing them to communicate without any form of distraction and leading to a heightened state of focus. Although it requires a number of different techniques to reach the state, the main contributing factor in the study was the device that relied on the human body's natural frequency following response. In the document, the researcher details the following statement. To achieve synchronization of brain hemispheres, the hemisync technique takes advantage of a phenomenon known as the frequency following response, or the FFR, which means that if a subject hears a sound produced at a frequency which emulates one of those associated with the operation of the human brain, the brain will try to mimic the same frequency pattern by adjusting its brainwave output. Therefore, if the subject is in a fully awake state, but hears sound frequencies which approximates brainwave outputs to the theta level, the subject's brain will endeavor to alter its brainwave pattern from the normal beta to the theta level. Additional techniques for reaching a sinking of the hemispheres include assisted hypothesis from a psychologist, as well as techniques that match transcendental meditation practices with a note stating that gurus who have practiced transcendental meditation practices for 20 years have the ability to reach a hemisphere sink for up to 15 minutes at a time without any form of assisted technology. According to the document, this training lasts around seven days before a person is capable of reaching a hemisphere sink frequency with the assistance of technology and is capable of furthering the study with tasks related to skill and a gateway process experience techniques. The first task that is given to the trained subject is that of problem solving. When under the influence of synced hemispheres, a subject can call upon its higher self for assistance in solving problems, with the higher self representing a form of unfiltered subconsciousness that can remember everything ever taught to the subject and use it for perfect creativity and logical deduction. The document details that this ability can be used to solve personal difficulties technical problems in the realm of physics, mathematics, science, practical administrative problems, and so on. In a way, turning the brain into an instantly responding and calculating computer that can analyze and process information at a much faster rate than normal. The second task that's given to a trained subject is referred to as an energy bar tool. The subject is then required to visualize and focus different forms of energy throughout its body being fed by the universe to allow the body to undergo rapid healing processes. This could mean that with the increased focus on the mind, the brain can suddenly consciousness force autonomous physical processes, such as healing and heart rate with ease. The third and usually described as the final task for most of the subjects is referred to by the researchers of the gateway process experience as remote viewing. Although it's not similar to traditional remote viewing noted by psychics to see distant locations using astral projection. Instead, the technique requires the subject to visualize and access parts of their memory and begin to holographically portray the memory in such a way as to allow the person to relive memories with perfect total recall. The researcher writing the document then notes that this is typically where training and ability of most of the subjects end and that less than 5% of the participants are able to move past these skills into the realm of impossible to understand psychic abilities. The document then details the following. The ability known as Focus 21 the future, the last and most advanced of all focus states associated with the gateway training program, involves movement outside of the boundaries of time space as in Focus 15, but with attention to discovering the future rather than the past. The individual who has achieved this state has reached a truly advanced level. The research document then goes on to state that the ability to travel into the future is accomplished only after the subject is able to master an out-of-body experience. This occurs when the natural brain frequency of the hemispheres are synced, and then reach a matching frequency with the background electromagnetic phenomenon of the universe allowing consciousness to imprint itself and begin to leave its body and journey out into the rest of the world, picking up electromagnetic information similar to how a radio captures radio waves, and how our eyes capture photons to imprint an image of our surrounding environment. 
Once this information begins to pour into the consciousness of a person, they can then begin the process of astral projection that will allow them to speed up time and look into the future, as well as deep within the past at moments that their memory would not be able to access. Unfortunately, the document does not go into any form of evidence surrounding the legitimacy of the claims of an out-of-body experience of the ability to see into the past or future with verifiable tests. Regardless of this lack of information, the formal conclusion of the document states the following. There is a sound, rational basis in terms of physical science parameters for considering the gateway process experience, to be plausible in terms of its essential objectives of heightened brain activity. Additionally, the document seems to hold several pages involving a new scientific theory as to the formation of the universe and that is actually a massive three-dimensional toroid, helping to explain why certain parts of the universe seem to be moving at faster speeds compared to others, as evidence of this donut shape moving the massive galaxies back down and around to the other side of the universe. The document then ends with the researcher stating that the gateway process experience should be provided to all members of the organization for heightened mental ability and goes on to suggest a 12-step plan as to how to provide the gateway training to all members of the organization. Although the document fails to elaborate on the finding, the memo then states the training could open up members of the gateway process to be attacked by intelligent energy beings, if the boundaries of time and space are being surpassed. Stating the following, Subjects must be intellectually prepared to react to possible encounters with intelligent, non-corporal energy forms when time-space boundaries are exceeded. With additional statements that perhaps practical use of the gateway process experience could be used to gather information from such entities and the universal consciousness. Humans have managed to accomplish a lot in a relatively short time. We've already sent humans to live in space and to the moon. We've developed large and very sophisticated telescopes that have been able to reach some of the most remote places in space. Many organizations have decided to take it a step further. The European Space Agency, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and NASA have been working very hard to find if we're completely alone. Organizations are now sending probes and rovers to distant planets in order to see if it hosts life. These missions have piqued the interest of millions of people worldwide, and due to our technology and the various photographs that get sent back, it's caused some to do a little digging of their own. It seems though that all this has done is worked against the organisations, as people from various countries have managed to find some mysterious anomalies on and around planets in our solar system. One of the most interesting discoveries is that of the Mars Tunnels. This discovery doesn't get much attention, but when it was discovered back in 1999, many people couldn't wrap their head around what the Mars Global Surveyor had captured. When the photographs started to get seen, various theories were put forward to try and explain them. One that received the most attention was that these photographs showed some type of ancient tunnel system that had been built on the Red Planet. This for some was the proof they'd been looking for, and that these structures were proof that an ancient civilization had once called this place home. The Mars Orbiter Surveyor was launched on the 7th of November 1996. It had taken years to build this incredible piece of equipment, but it's noted by NASA as being the first successful mission to the Red Planet in over 20 years. The Orbiter finally reached the Red Planet back in March of 1999, where it would then go on to map the terrain from a low altitude. Since this date it sent back thousands of images, Interestingly, many of which haven't been studied by researchers or scientists, and which some say do hide interesting anomalies that could help us understand the planet's environment better. This early surveyor was able to tell scientists a lot about Mars's surface, environment, atmosphere and interior. The camera that was on the Mars orbiter was able to send back some incredible images that would help us understand how we would approach this planet in the future when it came to missions. During this mission though, the spacecraft sent back some interesting photographs that some say can't be explained using natural explanations. As mentioned, one of the most interesting ones is that of the Mars Glass Tunnels. 
These mysterious tunnels have been described as looking like large, impressive structures that don't naturally occur on the planet. They have the typical shape of what you'd expect a tunnel to look like, and are partially covered by the surface's terrain, causing some to suggest that these structures are tens of thousands of years old. Interestingly, other high-quality photographs shows these tunnels as looking partially transparent. This was one of the first things that people noticed about them, with some saying that because of this translucent-like quality it made them stand out against the Martian backdrop. There's even others that went down a different route and suggested that what we're looking at could have been a creature, while others said that what we're looking at could be an ancient graveyard. This theory comes about after some compared the structures as looking like whale ribs and bones that are sometimes discovered in cold regions on our planet. Another idea is that these tunnel-like systems were created by giant iceworms. Iceworms are known to live in gravel beds or the banks of glacial ice. Some have suggested that this is what we're seeing here but on a much larger scale, again suggesting that many years ago these creatures existed and carved out these large tunnels. However, some have said this doesn't explain why the tubes appear to be partially transparent, and this has caused some to put forward the idea these were created by intelligent beings. Space agencies have said though these are not tunnels, but rather are natural dunes that have developed over the years. NASA even came forward and backed up this statement. David C. Perry of Earth and Space Sciences Division of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory said that there's nothing mysterious about these glass tunnel anomalies, and that what we're looking at is just a Martian dune. Dr. Perry is respected in his field, but some have disagreed with this statement, especially when they've gone on to compare the alleged anomalies with Mars dunes, saying that the two are not similar. Some even went forward to say that David hadn't viewed the zoomed-in images, and just received the original image that looks much different to the cropped version. In reality, the discovery has been at the center of an interesting discussion, which is, is there life on Mars? Regardless, it seems that believers are sticking to the idea that these are genuine tunnels, either created or dug out by something living on the red planet. Mars is the planet that people look to for life, perhaps because it's within reach and that it's always been featured in the news. Interestingly, NASA themselves have also dropped hints of this according to those who've looked into the topic. For example, going back a few months ago, one story that made the news came from one of NASA's chief scientists. NASA will soon be travelling to Mars in order to drill deep in the rocks. This is in the hopes of finding evidence of living organisms on the red planet. Mars could be home to current life as the space agency has expressed much interest in the planet over the years, along with upcoming space agency SpaceX, who have said they plan to put humans on the red planet within the next few years. Dr. Jim Green is the man who came forward and said the statement, and he thinks this mission could be a real success in finding life on Mars. However, he has said that he doesn't think people of our planet would be ready for the news, it's no secret that we've managed to accomplish a lot in a relatively short amount of time, and in regards to space, although it's massive, we've discovered some incredible things in recent years. It's been suggested by the scientists that this mission will likely be going on for the next few years, and that it will take some time to find out if there really is life on Mars. Dr. Green said the following about the upcoming mission. I've been worried about that because I think we're close to finding it and making some announcements. It will start a whole new line of thinking. I don't think we're prepared for the results. Interestingly, some have said they think we're close to discovering life on other planets, and they say this because it seems that space agencies are gearing up to explore space more. They use SpaceX and Space Force as an example, and say they think Space Force was established because they think they're trying to tell us something. Other countries have shown a massive interest in space. This includes places like China, who not too long ago made history by landing on the dark side of the moon. It's not just NASA who will be digging into the Martian surface. It's also reported that the European Space Agency along with Russia will also be heading to Mars, and their main goal is to find life.
saying they're hopeful and open to the idea that life could be on Mars. NASA's Mars 2020 rover will be sent to the planet with one mission, and that's to find life. Researchers have said it will be equipped with the newest technology that will help aid in this discovery, and that once it's collected samples it will be sent back to Earth. Dr. Green has said he's excited for this next step and that he wished the European Space Agency and Russia the best of luck in their mission. Dr. Green went on to say that if we discovered life it would be an incredible milestone, but it would also lead to many questions that we're not able to answer. For example, how did life get there? Are we related in some way and how long has it been there? Mars 2020 has a planned launch on the 30th of July 2020 and will hopefully touch down on Mars on the 18th of February 2021. Researchers now know that water exists on Mars, with scientists saying they think this lake sits under the planet's south polar ice camp, and it's around 12 miles or 20 kilometers across. All across the world, researchers have discovered incredible megalithic structures, Although they are impressive, they have continued to puzzle engineers and archaeologists in the modern era. Not only are these structures impossible to replicate in current times, but they were seen as monumental and impossible tasks for our ancient ancestors. How they built these structures is widely unknown, and has caused a massive stir in the archaeological communities. How could our ancient ancestors build such incredible structures in a time when it was deemed impossible? Various theories have been put forward to try and explain them, but the majority of these are just theories and are still up for debate. However, recently researchers have announced that one of Stonehenge's mysteries has been solved. Always a major fascination amongst the locals of the area and researchers from around the world, Stonehenge has proven to be quite a mystery to anyone who even attempts to understand its construction and the techniques behind it. Not only are the large blocks used so massive, that even modern means of construction would fail in regards to establishing Stonehenge, but the sources of the blocks appear to have been carved from hundreds of miles away, which lead many researchers to question the ability of transporting such large stones to the area. To add to this bizarre strangeness of the formation of Stonehenge, it's been discovered that the structure appears to have been built with astonishing precision in its placement and carved creation. The structure appears to be able to be used as a complex calendar, and can keep track of time to an incredibly mysterious accurate degree. However, this does insinuate that not only did the ancients have the technology to cut the stones with laser precision, transport the massive blocks, lift them with tremendous force and place them with perfect alignment, but that our ancestors also had the ability to make megalithic structures in a very short span of time. This continues to baffle researchers to this day who work to uncover more secrets regarding Stonehenge, such as its weird electromagnetic properties and special materials used in its creation. Others have even argued that the formation of the Great Stonehenge could be direct proof of ancient technologies and extraterrestrial intervention. Researchers and scientists don't agree with this notion though, and have even said they've unraveled one of its mysteries and this is where the famous large stones come from. Before this discovery, researchers only knew that the stones had been placed there around 2500 BC, but a new study carried out by researchers at the University of Brighton have announced that they've traced the stones to a woodland close to Wiltshire. It's here that they say the stones originated, and back when the monument was being constructed, this area would have been rich with these large sarsen boulders the rocks that were used to build Stonehenge. Further studies showed the team that the ancient civilization would have chosen these giant boulders because of their size, and how flat they were. This in turn is thought to have helped the prehistoric workers to have moved the stones. Interestingly, the team said that not only did they use these giant stones for Stonehenge, but they also used them to construct other structures. The team also said that over a thousand years before Stonehenge was constructed, the giant blocks would have been used to construct a massive local prehistoric tomb. This would have been for important individuals in the region. 
the archaeologists have said is an exciting discovery, and that now they're trying to work out the route in which the workers took to transport them. Although the team said they made great progress, they still said they want to work out how the workers transported these 15 to 45 ton stones over 15 miles. When looking into the route though, they said this would have been no easy task, as during some of these trips, these giant boulders would have had to have been hauled up an incline for several hundred meters. As of right now, more studies needed to determine how these ancient workers achieved this. Interestingly though, those who have looked into Stonehenge have said there's more than what meets the eye. For years, an archaeological site of significant importance has always been a major fascination amongst the locals of the area, and researchers from around the world, and that location is Stonehenge. And those who've studied the interesting monument have said it's proven to be quite a mystery to anyone who even attempts to try and understand it. When researchers attempted to better understand the strange electromagnetic phenomenon experienced at Stonehenge, they began to put forward a theory when plotting on a map a number of different megalithic monuments that points to the idea of one long and massive road that seems to have connected the monuments in a straight line. This would later lead to the theory that the spiritual placement of Stonehenge was that of a mystical property, and that this invisible road could have been referenced to a mystical line of energy that ran around the world known as a ley line. Though no one is quite sure that ley lines are responsible for it, it is believed there is a connection with that of the Earth's electromagnetic field, and a property of mystical energy surrounding the entire monument. Ley lines are lines that cut across the Earth spotted with landmarks, and historic structures, and convey alongside them flowing Earth energies, and these energies are concentrated at the points the lines meet. The concept behind the lines started with amateur archaeologist and businessman Alfred Watkins in 1921. This is when he realised that ancient sites appear to be lined up with others close by. He drew lines on his map to show that people that lived in Old Britain travelled in a straight line pattern, with major man-made or natural sites falling in this line. In his 1925 book, The Old Straight Track, he suggested that ancient Roman and medieval structures across the globe fall within these straight lines, but his proposal was rejected by experts and archaeological scholars. His fault finders noticed that his thoughts depended on drawing lines between destinations set up at various times of the past. They additionally contended that in ancient times it was unfeasible to go in a straight line over bumpy or rugged zones in Britain, rendering his ley lines far-fetched as trade routes. A year later, Watkins followers started the Straight Line Club, and in 1927 Watkins published a book titled The Ley Line Hunters, to help those interested in finding their own ley lines. The New Age movement interest in ley lines started in the 1960s by Earth Mysteries movement, growing from something ordinary to a whole field of study, with more published books, research and fans, gathering together to dig deeper and find new paths that ley lines led to. Most believe these lines had supernatural powers or mysterious energies, even though Watkins never had that thought in the beginning. Other paranormal subjects have infused the concepts of ley lines to include things like UFOs and Atlantis. Critics to this day feel that until ley lines are proven scientifically, it cannot be taken seriously as most of the connected lines are mere coincidence. Ley lines remain a mystery, and whether or not they're true, it goes to show man's interest in finding patterns in everything around us. It's interesting to think how far humanity has come in regards to structures. We've built some incredible ones in the modern day, but some of the most impressive and mysterious are those that our ancient ancestors built. Although we step closer to understanding how they did it, sometimes discoveries can throw up more questions than answers. These interesting discoveries and monuments make for interesting conversations and perhaps one day we'll be able to look back and understand just how they did it. So what do you make of this recent discovery? And how do you think the prehistoric workers were able to get the slabs to the Stonehenge location? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.